Okay, so we might as well get started pretty much on time. Uh, we are a small religious institution located in Northern New Jersey near New York City. We require no dogma or creed and our members follow a set of ethical principles which we try to affirm in our everyday lives. If you would like more information about us, please look in the chat where our website address will be posted. My name is Marilyn Maney, and I'm involved with social justice teams here at USR. Tonight, we're very excited to be sharing the story of Edmonia Lewis, sculptor. Two of our teams connected to bring you this presentation, the racial justice team and the art committee. And before I go any further, I'd like to introduce you to our lead member of the art committee, Carol Wolf, who would like to say a few words. Carol? Hi, uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, and on behalf of the art committee, I just want to really thank Marilyn for organizing this and Jennifer for uh, offering us this program. Um, it should be really interesting. I'm looking forward to learning about Edmonia Lewis because I don't know much about her myself. Um, I'm going to be monitoring the chat over the course of the evening if there's any questions and we'll save them up until the end so um, be sure to use the chat if there's anything you want to ask but uh, thank you all for coming thank you carol throughout history art has been used for communication and raising awareness about social issues artistic works express our common humanity they can challenge assumptions and inspire empathy as we will see, the sculptor we are discussing this evening seemed almost driven to sculpt, even though she was black and female and lived in the late 1800s, an almost unheard of combination. Here at USR, we have committed to be an anti-racist community with a pledge to reflect our stance in the culture and programming we provide. In that spirit, we explore and raise up impressive persons of all races especially those who have been underrepresented by tradition and long history and were victims of oppressive behavior. Tonight, we're very happy to have Jennifer Dassel, art historian, author, and the creator and host of Art Curious, the Art Curious podcast, an internationally popular bi-weekly show exposing the unexpected, the slightly odd, and the strangely wonderful in art history. The podcast was chosen as one of PC Magazine's best podcasts of the year for three years in a row. And I first heard Jennifer when she was on book tour and spoke at the Newark Museum. And um, I do have a copy of her book here. I hope you can see it. It's And Jennifer, we won't have to read it with a mirror. I know it's backwards, <laughs> but... <laughs> um, but it has a sim similar sounding title, Art Curious Stories of the Unexpected, Slightly Odd, and Strangely Wonderful in Art History. And it is a really fun read, so I, I would recommend it. Um, and I follow Jennifer on Instagram, where she posts luscious pictures of incredible artworks and commemorates historical events in the amazing world of art. Jennifer has a master's degree in art history and was a former curator at the North Carolina Museum of Art. Her contact information will also be posted in the chat. Um, as Carol mentioned, we will be taking questions at the end of the program. So please, during the program, if you have any, any questions that you'd like to ask Jennifer, um, please post them in the chat. And so without further ado, let me turn over the reins to our guest art historian, Jennifer Dassel. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for spending part of your evening with me here. I'm going to go ahead and get my presentation started, but I am thrilled and honored, and I just want to thank um, Marilyn and Carol and everyone at the, um, the Unitarian Society of Ridgewood for inviting me to come in and present to you tonight. I am so excited. I mean, really, there's almost nothing I love more than to talk about art. And I love talking about art with people who already know a lot about art. And I love it probably even more to share my enthusiasm 
for it with people who don't know a lot about art. So that's really been one of the goals that I've been working for for the last few years. Um, I started Art Curious, the podcast, about five years ago. And as uh, Marilyn mentioned, I'm also the host of the, or I, the, excuse me, the author of Art Curious, the book, which came out in 2020 and it was released by Penguin Books. So please do find me there and in print form and also in audio form if you are so inclined. But I am so excited to be able to give you this little tour through the life and works of the incomparable comparable Edmonia Lewis, because she was truly an amazing American sculptor. So thank you again for joining me today and uh, having a wonderful chance to talk on Zoom. So Edmonia, I think, is going to be someone who, once I heard about her, someone whose life and her works have really stuck with me. We were speaking before the Zoom started, just as a small group, that when I was coming up in art history and going through my bachelor's, my master's, and then moving on to PhD, coursework, I never heard about Edmonia Lewis. That was about 20 years ago. So really, it was sort of embarrassing and, and wonderful at the same time. When I finally started learning about her, oh goodness, maybe five, seven years ago, it's been an incredible experience to learn about somebody who was so popular during her lifetime that then fell out of favor and really disappeared from art history. So I am so excited to share her life with you. I want to start, seems like a little bit of an off, offbeat start, but I want to begin with a brief chat about fads tonight because I find trends and fads to be a little mystifying sometimes, honestly, as someone who I think I don't often engage with fads from a, a fashion or a pop culture front, at least not as much as I did when I was younger. Um, I do realize that while I'm saying that I am a podcaster mentioning this, and that feels a little trendy at the very least. So support, you know, I might be coming from this somewhat ironically, but anyhow, so trends, obviously we know they come and go and fads are usually short lived to be sure. But what I find most interesting is how some people, so not just games or shoes or anything like that, but how some people can be so, so popular, so world renowned and then fade from memory so quickly. So how can somebody who is a highly lauded and really celebrated public figure for example, move from acclaim to obscurity with hardly a second thought within very short years of their lifetime. So I think in our own age, of course, with the internet at the ready, our memory footprints, they last a little bit younger, uh, longer for, for lack of a better word. So when I love to show, I have a seven-year-old here at home, and when I love to show him commercials for toys from the 1980s, you know, it's, it's just a click away on YouTube. So nostalgia and fads don't feel like they're that far away, but over 150 years ago, as we know, there lived this artist who was so lauded and so celebrated that people would visit her art studio from around the world. She was literally a tourist stop on um, all kinds of tours throughout the Grand Tour of Europe. But then uh, just even a few years later, a couple of decades later, by the beginning of the 20th century, very few people actually remembered her name. So. I think there are understandably a lot of different factors that are at play in the, you know, quote unquote, disappearance of Edmonia Lewis from the forefront of American and even European societies that she engaged with. But luckily, I think we can all say that we're all so excited that she's no longer been shoved by the wayside. And she's very much at the front of American art history, finally, where she very rightly belongs. And I personally love her. So I was so thrilled to have the opportunity to share her with you today and to acquaint you or perhaps reacquaint you with this incredible artist. So Mary Edmonia Lewis is her full given name. She was nicknamed Wildfire and she was believed to have been born on July 4th. So 4th of July baby in 1844, but no one knows exactly for sure. Uh, the years of her birth have been bandied about as anywhere between 1840 and 1844. So, you know, she could have been in any of those realms, uh, those words. 
What we do know is that she was born in the town of Greenbush, New York. So she was a black woman not born into an enslaved family in the US in the years preceding the Civil War. Her father was a man named Samuel Lewis, and he was of African and Haitian descent, while her mother, Catherine, was of African American and Native American descent. So there have been many different, uh, I guess not many, a couple of different ways that people have connected her to Native American tribes. And most people think that she was either from the Chippewa tribe or a sub-tribe related to the Ojibwe from Canada's First Nations. Most of the time, you will probably see her listed as being from the Chippewa tribe. So she has this very interesting and really fascinating mixed heritage, which was something that Lewis herself was very proud of. Um, and so you'll find out it's something that would invariably come to play in her artwork, which of course we'll get to in a moment. So that's really interesting. She was especially close to her mother's side of the family, and they essentially raised her after she was orphaned at either the age of five or the age of nine. Again, no one is quite sure about a lot of the exact timing when it comes to Edmonia Lewis's life. As the story goes, her mother's relatives uh, were semi-nomadic. And so when Edmonia engaged with them first early on with her mother, and then after she went to stay with them after she was orphaned, um, she said she would spend her time pitching in by selling Native American goods and wares. She learned how to sew moccasins and generally just really enjoying all the freedoms of living so close to nature. And you can really get a sense of Edmonia Lewis's love of the world around her, the natural world, from her writings. So she did do a little bit of writing and she was interviewed quite extensively, uh, at least in the high point of her career, which is very cool. It's wonderful to have a documentation of her own words. And one of her most famous sayings, something that you'll see, I think, repeated anywhere from Pinterest and Instagram and beyond, is that she loves to talk about nature. And she said really beautifully, she said once, quote, there is nothing more beautiful than the free forest. To catch a fish when you are hungry, to cut the boughs of a tree, make a fire to roast it and eat it in the open air is the greatest of all luxuries. So she spent a lot of her earliest years again with her mother's family, living out this kind of natural, um, incredible life. And then she spent some of her years actually attending school at a Baptist run abolitionist school. And according to her recollections later in life, she was declared to be wild there. And so really she was sort of left to her own resources. And she later then said, they could do nothing with me, um, which I think makes perfect sense in some ways, considering that her nickname was Wildfire. So it was really back to the great school of nature that she returned, at least for a little bit of time. And that is something that I think really drove her earliest memories and later in life, some of the choices that she made in her subject matter. So she would say that she would not stay a week pent up in cities if it were not for my passion for art. So nature was her first love, but art became her true love. And the thing that really, of course, would drive her future moving forward. She knew that art really needed to be something that would be learned and understood best in a particular setting. So she sought out the chance early on to get a top-notch education. So now we come upon the year of 1859, and this was truly a really big year for Edmonia Lewis. Her older brother, Samuel, so named after their father, also named Samuel, he had moved west with um, previously with hopes of prospecting gold and really hitting it rich in the uh, gold rush. So he's, by the way, a really interesting figure that I've only sort of vaguely have looked into, but he traveled first to California and then Idaho before settling in Bozeman, Montana, and that's where he stayed for the rest of his life, which is really interesting. So here is the house that um, he was lived in until his death here. Um, it's really interesting. This is uh, this. I just found this fascinating. This is on the Registry of Historic National Register of Historic Places, and it was built in 1883. So when he settled down, he was able to have enough financial stability that he asked Edmonia if he would be able to bring her out further away from uh, 
New York and see if he could have, have, uh, provide her with financial assistance so that she could then go to college. 1859, again, this is amazing that she had this opportunity. So she was able to have enough of um, a nest egg for her finances, for, for her education, that she moved to Ohio to attend Oberlin College with the intention of studying art there. Let me see if I can move that out of the way. Okay, there we go. So although Oberlin was actually one of the first places in the country to accept both women and African-American students. It's really fascinating because they did both at the same time. And this is in a time in US history when accepting one or the other, let alone both, was actually incredibly rare for US institutions. That being said, even though there was all this freedom and all these different people who were being able uh, accepted and coming to Oberlin, that didn't necessarily mean that Edmonia Lewis had a great time there. And in fact, her experiences at Oberlin were fraught with racism and also some terrible personal disasters, as we'll find out. So in 1862, so this is about three years after the beginning of her tenure at Oberlin, there was this really terrible, strange situation that happened. The story goes, and of course, this is all, you know, more than 150 years later, some of the details are blurry. What we do know is that ostensibly after hanging out with a group of friends before an afternoon sledding trip that they were all planning to take, Edmonia Lewis served up some mold wine, some spiced wine to some of her classmates to warm them up. And it's, to me sounds like a really wonderful thing to offer your friends on a cold day. And it might've been a very nice intention, but what ended up happening was obviously not great. So Edmonia Lewis's two classmates who were served the spiced wine became severely ill soon after. And though the women recovered from their sicknesses, they were severely ill for a while, but neither of them died. They obviously recovered quite, quite well, but because they, even though they had recovered, there was still this firestorm of scandal and rumor. And even though the doctors found absolutely no evidence among these women of any kind of foul play, it was nevertheless assumed that Lewis was moving forward and trying to attempt a poisoning of her colleagues, her classmates. And so the town of Oberlin itself did not take the story well. It became huge news. And again, I want to reiterate that there was nothing concrete that could be pointed to in terms of Edmonia Lewis's guilt. It was just that she was naturally assumed to be guilty. And very um, terribly, I mean, all, all of this aside, some people tried to take matters into their own hands when they thought that perhaps Edmonia Lewis had intended to poison these women. So vigilante style, something equally awful happened, which was that one evening, not too terribly long after, while she was walking home at night on her own, Edmonia Lewis was attacked and she was dragged into a nearby field and she was beaten so severely that she nearly died. And, um, you know, we're thankful that her body was actually found. She was nearly lifeless, but somebody happened to come by at the right time and rescued her. But even after that moment, she was then arrested for the assumed poisoning of her friends. So can you imagine? I mean, this is a lot of terrible things happening to this poor woman and, and also this college town at the same time. So thankfully, I can say that this story has a happy ending or at least kind of a happy ending. And that is that Lewis's poisoning trial was managed by the only, the single only practicing African-American lawyer in town at Oberlin, and he led her to an acquittal. So even though most of the so-called witnesses that were brought into the trial actually testified against her, she still was able to come out acquitted, which is really wonderful news. So how much of the testimony, let alone the trial itself, could be chalked up to that terrible combination of racism and misogyny, I think is truly anyone's guess, but I would assume that's probably a lot of it was at hand there. But again, the bottom line is that Edmonia Lewis was not found guilty of an attempting poisoning, an attempted poisoning, excuse me. 
At the same time, this did not mean, this acquittal did not mean that the rest of her time at Oberlin went smoothly, as you might imagine. She still experienced a quite significant amount of racial prejudice post-trial, even at Oberlin, which we think of both then and now as being a fairly progressive university. And what ended up happening was that she was accused of stealing art supplies from her university department. And again, no evidence ever came to light to support this, but the damage was still done in that she was automatically assumed to be the one who did the crime, just full stop. And so she was asked to leave Oberlin right before the start of her final term. So she was unable to register in her final courses. And that meant that then she then could not go on to graduate. So it was after these incredibly turbulent years, these final two years of her time at Oberlin, that she decided to put Ohio behind her. And so she left and relocated to Boston. And so at this point, we know that art was really at the top of the list for Edmonia Lewis in Boston. And thankfully, she was able to make some worthwhile connections fairly quickly so that her relocation really became a boon for her. And part of that was because she got a lot of assistance and support from several abolitionists like Robert Gould Shaw, who you will see here. This is her bust that she created of him. And then she also trained it, uh, excuse me, trained under a self-taught sculptor named Edward Brackett. And it was really under his tutelage that she honed in her artistic skills and she managed to reestablish her in um, herself in this new and you know a little bit more welcoming environment. And it was at this point that she moved fully into wanting to specialize in sculpture. And Edward Brackett's sculpture specialty himself was marble portrait busts. So you see this, these images right here on the screen are um, images being, you know, a person from the chest up. So you, these portraits that are very specific, mostly to the faces of the person. And so being around this environment and learning from him directly, it really rubbed off on Edmonia Lewis. And she studied with him for about two years. And even though Brackett and Lewis eventually had some kind of falling out, the details of which have not, at least not yet, have been found. Uh, we do know that Brackett's tutelage directly influenced um, his students' art uh, output and ability. So it all went well at that point, is what I'm saying. And by 1864, so really not very long after arriving in Boston, we know that she had made her very first sale. It is a sculpture of a woman's hand, and she sold it for $8 which I can only imagine was a lot back in 1864. The one sad thing that's not great is that this particular single image of a or work of a woman's hand has never been found. So it's hopefully it's still out there and it has not been destroyed or lost, but it just has not yet been identified as a work by Edmonia Lewis. But uh, after that, really, things started moving pretty quickly for her. So within later that year, 1864, she enjoyed her very first solo art exhibition. And it was at that point, it was very well received. And so things started moving very quickly. She garnered increasingly more fame and attention, not only throughout Boston, but her fame really started spreading throughout the East Coast. And so, of course, that naturally brought in more commissions, a number of which I'll be showing Showing you as I cycle through part of this, um, this portion of the talk. She also used her newfound fame, I think, to personal advantage to reject the narrative that had previously been assigned to her. And this is really fascinating because a lot of people didn't end up knowing about her background and her experience at Oberlin. So she was being discussed in this way that really painted her as a victim, a recipient of awful abuse, and the survivor of a near-death experience that was brought on by prejudice and racism and, and, of course, possible misunderstanding as well. And indeed, I think what's really fascinating is that she did not accept that narrative, and she took her fame as she was able to get more and more attention to really craft the telling of her own life story for her own purposes. The press, I think, in particular, was extremely interested in these fantastical stories about her upbringing. So as many would do, I believe, in the same position, Edmonia tended to emphasize and or tweak certain aspects of her background in order to suit the narrative of different audiences and different publications, really depending on what she wanted to promote or sell. 
So for example, I have this quote up on the screen, which the press just lapped up. She said, quote, my mother was a wild Indian and was born in Albany of copper color and with straight black hair. There she made and sold moccasins. My father, who was a Negro and a gentleman's servant, saw her and married her. This one isn't completely fabricated. There is actually some truth to this. And also I have to point out the, the idea of self image making and having power and agency over one story is in theory, a really good idea, a really powerful idea because it's really incredible to be able to tell your own life story, whether or not it's entirely factually um, accurate is one thing. And in, in Monia Lewis's case, sometimes she embellished a little bit. So you can imagine that this would eventually cause modern day art historians and biographers a whole lot of trouble because over the last century in particular, as Edmonia Lewis you know, appeared again in the forefront of art history, it's been difficult to kind of determine what's real about her life, what was pure fabrication either on her part or on the press's part in trying to sell a really interesting story. Because most of all, people were really excited and interested in her achievements because of her mixed racial identity as well as her gender. And both of those aspects were really heav heavily covered in the press because a woman of color pursuing a profession in the arts at the very least was a novelty during this period. And then on top of it all, something that's not really mentioned much, um, I would say until probably the 20th century, is that sculpture, and this by the way, is a, an image of a sculpture, a sculptural relief of a Renaissance sculpture guild from a church in Florence. So you see on the right side is someone who is um, creating a marble sculpture. I like to point that out because sometimes when I've shown this image in the past, people are saying, why is that man trying to pickaxe a baby, a very <laughs> giant baby? And I have to say, no, it's a like a marble cupid or something that someone is, is sculpting. But anyway, this is all my very long-winded way of saying that sculpture for the very, very longest time was considered a particularly masculine form of art making because you had to supposedly have a lot of strength and power to both yield your sculpture tools and then also to manage the typically heavy materials. So things like marble, which was Edmonia Lewis's go-to material. And then there was also the fact that sculpture was considered very dirty work because you would have to get in there with your hands, you would get marble dust all over you. And so it was really thought of to be something that ladies did not engage in. So when Edmonia Lewis comes in with this incredible story, this background, she's a woman working in sculpture, she is African American, she's Native American. It's like, well, this was a big story. This was a big deal. So there was a lot of excitement. And so the press, of course, as I was alluding to a moment ago, they began concocting their own a very erroneous versions of her life story. So there's one story that became widely circulated about her life that quoted that she became a sculptor because when she first moved to Boston, she found herself, quote, overwhelmed by the sight of a statue of Benjamin Franklin that was in Boston. And at that moment, Lewis had supposedly never thought about sculpting before, that had never been something that she had learned about while she was being college educated. Um, apparently these narratives said that she reportedly saw this image of uh, Benjamin Franklin drop down to her knees and then said, oh, how I would love to make a man in stone, unquote. So that was what the story was, with that she really was painted as um, an uneducated, kind of rough around the edges, naive creator who could not even come up with the word sculpture or sculptor or statue. And it was these kind of stories that audiences, but especially white audiences, really loved. And I think it was almost considered a kind of rags to riches story because it's, you know, thinking like, look at this woman, look at this artist now who could not only make a man in stone, as she supposedly said, but also had the right kind of knowledge and the right kind of training to make it big. And of course, the right kind of talent. 
So in some ways, I think this myth making of Edmonia Lewis, I think this actually ended up suiting her just fine because it allowed her to keep her actual self and her actual life story a little bit more of a mystery. So sometimes she would really lean into those partially fabricated stories that were um, written about her. So with such enthusiasm and press coverage of her life and works, I think it's really wonderful because Ammonia Lewis was able to save up enough cash, especially based on the many commissions and sales that she has started to achieve, so that she was able to undertake the next step in her process, which was another big relocation. So in 1865, Lewis left Boston for Europe. We have an actual copy of her passport application, which is what you see on the screen here. And so she was really part of this big tradition of joining a burgeoning population of American artists who were moving and living abroad to study and work as artists. But unlike a lot of many other American artists at this exact moment, especially thinking about her one of her peers and heroes, who was the also incredibly talented and popular African-American painter, Henry Ossowa Tanner, she, unlike him, unlike many others, decided to give Paris a pass. And she found inspiration instead in Rome. She certainly wasn't alone. I'm not saying that this was very rare. I'm simply saying that Paris tended to be the first stop that most people would go. If you wanted to be an artist in the 19th century, most of the time you did choose Paris. But Rome at this time was really interesting and it's really wonderful because something fascinating was happening in Rome at this time. It became, in the late 19th century, the second half of the 19th century, it became a gathering place for a group of American women artists, so expatriates all, who were working together and really supporting one another, forming this community of American women artists. And many of them ended up being sculptors. So on the screen, I have a couple of people here. We have Harriet Hosmer and then Margaret Foley. But there were many others, people who became very famous, like Emma Stebbins. And it was Harriet Hosmer, who's the woman you see next to that colossal statue there on the left side of the screen, who urged Edmonia Lewis to actually come to Rome. And it was her who helped her to arrange her studio rental and her um, living quarters near the Piazza Barberini, which very auspiciously ended up being the former studio of the 18th century Italian neoclassical sculptor Antonio Canova. So really, Edmonia felt like she was just living in the perfect place because this incredible sculptor who was um, I mean, truly amazing. I mean, one of the most amazing sculptors of the neoclassical era was somebody she admired and now she was living and working in his former studio. So she was thrilled and she thrived there. And it certainly didn't hurt to work in, I think, such proximity to um, the kind of things that made Rome in its long artistic history and tradition, such an incredible hotspot for architecture and sculpture. And I love seeing that in some of her works, you can see elements that she's taking on these or tackling these traditional kind of Roman scenes and works of art. And so we have her having this take of the young Octavian that we now have at the Smithsonian. And then I also love that she did her own study of Michelangelo's Moses. So that's really cool. And I love that there's a quote from her talking about how much Rome was a shock to her artistic system when she first arrived. She said, quote, I thought I knew everything that there was when I came to Rome, but I soon found out that I had everything to learn about art. And learned she did. And again, it also doesn't hurt that she now had access to the finest things when it came to sculpture. So she had the finest marble in the world, Carrara marble, the kind of work of uh, stone that people like Michelangelo were creating their incredible pieces out of. And she also had access to highly trained Italian stone carvers working in that old tradition. At the same time though, I think it's wonderful and fascinating because Edmonia Lewis was nothing if not an example of this incredible independent American spirit. So she had this do it yourself attitude and a kind of pull yourself up by the bootstraps mentality. And unlike sculptors, I think most of the sculptors of her generation, especially the women who she worked with alongside in Rome, 
she very rarely employed other stone carvers to assist her. So she did have a couple assistants in her studio as time passed on, but most, the vast majority of the works that she created in her time in Rome were ones that she created with little to no assistance. And that was one of those things that immediately set her apart in a field that was so chock full of talent. The other thing that was in Lewis's um, care, I think, in choosing her subject matter was her care for choosing her subject matter in sculptures, because she paid very critical attention to what was happening in the world around her. And so she strategized very smartly so that her works would have appeal to the wants and needs of the for certain patrons and also the vast number of patrons that she could. So I always like to talk about her experience in the US prior to moving to Rome, because in the US during the tail end of the Civil War, so this was that period right before her departure for Europe, uh, we learned that she really found reciprocal interest and common interest in promoting the works of uh, ab ab abolitionists and other anti-slavery advocates. And so these were really relationships that she had with these people that allowed her to work to sell works of art that would appeal to the um, audiences that would really gravitate towards anti-slavery subjects matters. And then also people who wanted to commemorate those who were working abolitionists. So like this bust, for example, of James Peck Thomas, who was another uh, um, African-American abolitionist. This is a work from 1874, by the way. But then after she moved to Europe and the abolition, you know, she moved away from the abolitionist movement of the US, she then gradually transitioned away from showing a lot of African American and of abolitionist portrayals. And she moved instead toward creating religious sculptures, which was something that she would have clearly witnessed and experienced a lot of in a Catholic country like Italy. And Edmonia, by the way, also identified as Catholic. So she was also very aware of pop culture trends and again, very smartly worked within those realms. And so take, for example, this is, I love this, two of her well, I think most well-loved works, which are not too far down the road from you. These are both in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. These are marble busts of the star-crossed Native American lovers, Hiawatha and Minnehaha. So Hiawatha on the left, Minnehaha on the right. And both works were created in 1868 and they paid homage to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's epic poem, The Song of Hiawatha. And this poem was huge in the late 19th century. I mean, giant. It was something that inspired all kinds of art. Here's a bust that she did of Lewis, by the way, which is really fascinating. He got his own very, very personal Edmonia Lewis portrait bust. But talk about fads and trends that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk. The Song of Hiawatha was such a biggie in the second half of the 19th century that all kinds of artworks were uh, portray portraying it. It was so truly popular. It was this huge part of the cultural zeitgeist. Here are just three works out of many dozens of, of artists throughout both the US and Canada and also Western Europe, people who were imitating scenes and coming up with scenes from the Song of Hiawatha. So by no means, again, I want to make this clear, by no means was her working within these trends any sort of negative, you know, an oddity or, or a strange machination because not then and not now uh, was it strange because in today's contemporary field, for sure, artists have long been really connected to the ideas of what was really exciting and in the culture at any given moment and then creating works that express it. And I think that's one of the jobs of contemporary art. And I also love to remind people that at any given moment that an artist is creating a work of art, their work is contemporary. So it can be something that really engages so clearly with the present moment. And it can also be something that as we might find out shortly, may not necessarily be beloved. So keep that in mind. And again, it did not hurt at all that works like the Minnehaha and the um, Hiawatha that we saw a moment ago. And also this one, another scene that she did called the Marriage of Hiawatha, 
none of this hurt that they were also these little nods to her own Native American heritage. And I think that must have also added some cachet to her uh, depictions. And again, as I mentioned, she did sculpt multiple works that connected not only to the Hiawatha poem, but then also to Native Americans in general. So this one's called the Old Arrow Maker. But I think it's one thing to go along with the trend and then something entirely different to capitalize smartly and cater to the wishes of your audiences. So, which Edmonia Lewis did. She wanted to sell her works. She wanted her works to be collected. That's how she made her living. And above all, her work was of the highest quality. Her story and her personality were compelling. So to me, it seems like looking back, it seems like it shouldn't be a surprise to know that she became truly hot stuff during her lifetime. But then you want to counterbalance it by saying, I mean, it is kind of surprise because of her racial makeup. We know that she wasn't able to escape discrimination in the US or at least not very easily. And that was really the number one reason she left the US to move to Rome in the first place. And that was something that she did not shy away from admitting. She noted, quote, I was practically driven to Rome in order to obtain the opportunities for art culture and to find a social atmosphere where I was not constantly reminded of my color. The land of liberty had not room for a colored sculptor. But then her move paid off. She became known as one of the greatest artists of her time, and she was a sculptor who received international commissions and acclaim. And again, if she was an American woman of mixed heritage living and working abroad. So if Edmonia Lewis isn't one of the greatest success stories in 19th century art history, I truly don't know who is. It's amazing. The acclaim and the coverage of her life and work really just kept on coming after this point. And her success became international news. So this is a very, very blurry screenshot. I was just able to have located it in the New Orleans Picayune. And it speaks of her having received, as you can see, near the kind of middle of that block. It says that she was able to receive two single commissions amounting to $50,000 each. So I found this in a newspaper archive and I'd read this blurb that this had happened to her. So I was excited to be able to locate the actual screenshot of it. And one of the things that I did was I wanted to do a historical currency calculator to see what $50,000 in 1873 would end up being in today's currency. And it is the equivalent in these two commissions, the equivalent to over $1 million each. So no wonder that she not only enjoyed solo art exhibitions of her work in major cities, not only Rome, but Chicago and London, but that her art studio, as I mentioned at the beginning, became sought after as a highly popular tourist destination, a tourist destination. I want to show you this because unfortunately I don't have a cartoon that was drawn of Edmonia Lewis's studio visits during her lifetime, but Harriet Hosmer, her friend and colleague, uh, was also a major tourist draw. So this is a print that showcases and commemorates the Prince of Wales meeting and seeing her work at her studio. So I wish that I could unearth a print that showed something similar at Edmonia Lewis's, but I don't know if something was ever made or if it existed to show that she was an equal tourist draw. Now, I'm transitioning a little bit into the next phase of my talk because I think perhaps the most fascinating story about Edmonia Lewis isn't about her per se, but it's about the life of her most famous work of art. And it is a story that I think really reveals the rise and the fall and the rise again of Edmonia Lewis's popularity and her influence and then also her acceptance into art history. But first I need to give you a little bit of background. So again, we've established that she has incredible international claim and appeal, so it would make sense for her works to be requested for some of the biggest events of the day, the biggest expositions and exhibitions. And one of the biggest was the 1876 Centennial Exhibition, which was held in Philadelphia that year to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And Edmonia Lewis, alongside many others, including I think very famously Thomas Aikens, who was a very wonderful American painter, was asked to contribute a work of art. And for her participation in this exhibition, 
Edmonia Lewis went all out. So she, no, no portrait busts, no small figures. She wanted to do something really, really big, something literally huge. And so for this event, she sculpted a monumental full body image of Cleopatra seated on her throne in the last moments of her life after allowing herself to be bitten and committing suicide by the venom from a poisonous snake. And this is a truly an incredible work of art. This piece, it's called The Death of Cleopatra. It weighed in at over 3,000 pounds, and it was a major sight to behold. And very quickly, it became one of the most talked about works of art at the Centennial Exhibition, really due to its combination, I think, of Cleopatra's beauty and the uh, amazing talent that is evident here in the sculptor's ability, but then also the fact that the sculptor chose to memorialize the moment of her death, the moment of her passing away, rather than another moment that shows her more, um, I think, engaged and obviously living, which was something that many artists had really focused more on during uh, art history's traditions. So many people really would showcase the death scene of Cleopatra, but it was always the moment right before she died, as opposed to this moment where we see her more languid and um, really dead, just dead. So again, I have to say, of course, this was all very deliberate. Edmonia Lewis knew what she was doing, and she was very smart with her intentions for the work. I read this really incredible article by a historian named Susanna Gold, and she talks about that she's tracing the link between the ideals of freedom and independence that the Centennial Exhibition was celebrating, and then also connecting that to Edmonia Lewis's choice of choosing Cleopatra as her subject to be shown in a country whose track record with freedom and independence at this point especially had really only been directed at certain peoples. And so, as a woman with a, at least a very partial African-American heritage, Lewis was very careful not to allude directly to the emancipation of slaves because she knew that would be a very hot button issue, but she also didn't want to possibly touch on any other issues or topics that might infuriate a still seething, just, you know, very post-Civil War country. At the same time, as Susanna Gold points out, she has this knowledge that Cleopatra, though not typically in art portrayed as being a Black African, was of course, Egypt is in Africa. Cleopatra was an African woman. So the connection between what Gold calls the potential expectation of Cleopatra's Blackness and Edmonia Lewis's own Blackness and experience of racism was really the ever-present subtext. Um, and Edmonia's own heritage and experiences of racism, I think, really majorly played into this, at least in that kind of quiet mode. Cleopatra had really become, at this point in art, a symbol of Africa's power and also its beauty, and a reminder of the glories of its historical figures and the importance of the present descendants of people of African nations. So that's a lot of really big stuff. That's a lot of heavy statements that are coming at you. So it was a partial firestorm if it was made, ex I mean, really partial. It was would have been an incredible firestorm if all of those different tangents were made explicit. So what's really interesting is it seems to be very, very deliberate that Edmonia Lewis chose to create this huge game-changing sculpture in the most pristine white marble that she could to get her hands on. So she effectively and almost quite literally whitewashes Cleopatra from that racial perspective. So it's really interesting. She was being very gutsy in her subject matter, but at the same time, really trying to cover herself and keep herself safe as possible. So really showing this sculpture in a way that would be most, most palatable, I think, to as many obvious audience members at the time. So all of this, I think, is enough to make The Death of Cleopatra a work that stands out very clearly in Edmonia Lewis's career. But what happens next in the story of this sculpture is crazy. And I think it's definitely a story that is one for the books, like art history books for sure. So after the Centennial Exhibition, the intention was that such a stunning work of art would obviously get sold either to a very wealthy art collector or, you know, hopefully to a museum who wanted to collect it. But that didn't pan out for whatever reason. Um, I think certainly the neoclassical style this is riffing on 
uh, that others like Lewis were working on also at the same time period, it eventually and slowly lost popularity. But regardless, it was also a giant work and the out outcome was the same regardless of what the style or, or tastes or fads were at the time. What ended up happening was that the death of Cleopatra remained unsold. And being that it was too big, it was really too large to then ship back to Europe with Edmonia to return to her studio. So it had to remain in America. So eventually Edmonia Lewis placed the work in storage before agreeing to exhibit one more time. So it was shown stateside one more time in an exhibition in Chicago. And it was there that it was bought by a man named Blind John Condon. And he was a saloon owner in Chicago. And his side hustle was that he owned a horse racing track in nearby Forest Park, Illinois. And he had a favorite horse who was coincidentally named Cleopatra. And he loved Cleopatra, his favorite horse. And when Cleopatra the horse passed away, uh, Condon was so distraught that this sculpture that he had bought for his namesake horse, he then refashioned as the headstone for the horse's grave. This is all true, which is incredible. And then he put in a stipulation that said that neither the grave itself nor the sculpture would ever be moved from that site. So unfortunately, of course, though, as the site changed hands, it morphed from becoming a racetrack to becoming a golf course. It was a Navy base for a while and a post office. And then it eventually just became this field. This was a screenshot of that particular area that I was able to find on Google that kind of just backs up to a neighborhood. Um, the de facto owners who then ended up owning this parcel of land ignored Condon stipulation, of course, and they moved this giant marble sculpture to a scrapyard in Cicero, Illinois. And it sat there just ignored and really unkempt and basically was all but forgotten. But thankfully, this is not the end of the story. So in the late 18, uh, excuse me, 1980s, there was a retired fireman who just ended up being a Boy Scout troop leader who came into this scrapyard in Cicero and he found, and I'm kind of using that in air quotes, found uh, the work of art. And he saw that it was in kind of a dilapidated state and decided that it would be the perfect fit for a scout service project, like a renovation of the sculpture. So together, the scouts and the troop leaders went through, that was my cat sneezing, apologies, um, went through, they cleaned up the sculpture a little bit. And because it was right around the holidays, they then glued and painted it and made it a little kind of holiday festive and presented her then to the Historical Society of Forest Park. Now, at this point, they had no idea of the maker. They had no idea about the meaning or the history of the work of art, but they just thought it was a very cool looking sculpture, which it is. And they thought that the uh, Historical Society would know something to do with it or would like it to at the very least to have it in its hands. But someone did have an inkling at the Historical Society of Forest Park that it was an important work of art. And that was their society director, Frank Orland. And through a very long process of, I think, just research driven by utter curiosity, he Sherlocked his way into a belief that this was a work by Edmonia Lewis that had gone missing. And then he used his sleuthing to tip off Marilyn Richardson, who is an independent curator, a professor, and also an Edmonia Lewis scholar. And Orland became so sure that he was sitting on this long lost, forgotten Edmonia Lewis masterpiece that he asked Marilyn Richardson if she would come out and take a look at it. And she was very hopeful, but wary because she had been doing what she could to try to track down this work of art for probably a couple of decades at this point in her career. So she did travel to Forest Park and joined Frank Orland to view this purported Lewis sculpture. And it was there in a storage facility at the Forest Park Mall for a while in, in Illinois. And it was apparently standing there amidst discarded Christmas decorations, half empty paint cans in this storage facility that the Historical Society had at this mall. And at the same time, Marilyn Richardson could just see it kind of in the dark. This is a screenshot from an article from the Chicago Tribune. And she was able to say immediately, 
this is it. This is the sculpture I've been waiting for. We have been looking for this forever. This is the missing huge Edmonia Lewis sculpture. So Frank Orland's uh, hunch was right and Marilyn Richardson knew of its importance immediately. And so after over a hundred years, it finally received the you know, honors that it deserved. You can't quite see it from here, but in the next image, you can see a couple other uh, details of how it looked not great even after they removed the Christmas decorations. It needed a little bit of love. So they were able to get a $30,000 restoration job. And then today it lives as a star attraction at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And I truly can't imagine a better place for one of the most, I think, fascinating and interesting and important works of art by a 19th century American sculptor. But I always have to say, I always end the story by saying, I still think it's pretty cool that it, for a very short part of its life, it ended up being a headstone for a horse. How many works of art can you say that about? Not many, I don't think. <laughs> I think it's, in some ways, it's interesting to look at the story of the loss and the rediscovery and the elevation of the death of Cleopatra as a story that really interestingly mirrors the events of Edmonia Lewis's own life. Sadly, because by the late 1870s, she was still creating some truly highly sought after works of art, including portraits for the likes of former President Ulysses S. Grant, who commissioned her directly to make his portrait bust, which again, as I mentioned with the, the first work of art that she created, the hand sculpture, that bust of Ulysses S. Grant has, again, not quite come to light, hopefully yet, maybe it hopefully will someday. And her Roman studio was still a, um, an attraction through the beginning of the 1880s. But again, as I mentioned previously, the excitement over neoclassical artwork style really became out of favor by the time the 1880s rolled around. And Lewis's clientele at that point began to diminish. And by the turn of the century, so 1900, she had produced mainly religious sculptures for the Italian Catholic Church and really little else because that seemed to be the only place where she could get relatively consistent commissions. And at that point, once things dwindled down quite a bit, she decided again to make a change and she moved this time to London. And it's really at this point that the trail for Edmonia Lewis's life went cold. There was hardly anything about her written. Um, and it really feels like these final years of her life is in many ways still a mystery to us. Because just like with the death of Cleopatra, it seemed like Ammonia Lewis kind of disappeared off the map. She had fallen into obscurity so much so that until very relatively recently, it really wasn't a known fact of the exact date of her death, not even the year of her death or the location. All of it was really guessed at. And for the longest time, people assumed that she ended up dying in Rome since she lived there for so long. But then others, I think, post, uh, posited that she had died in an unmarked grave. She was buried in an unmarked grave in the Bay Area in California. And then even still, a newspaper um, in 1900 said that she was still, or excuse me, 1909, said that she was still alive and living and working happily in Rome. So no one for the very longest time actually knew what happened to Edmonia Lewis. But thankfully, you know, once the second wave of feminism, especially in the US and Western Europe started picking up, then the interest in female artists also started picking up momentum in the 1970s and beyond. And so at that point, you can see with Marilyn Richardson being an art historian, uh, really interested in Edmonia Lewis at that point, that interest in Edmonia's work started picking up. And thanks to Marilyn Richardson's diligence and a bunch of other art historians, she really at that point, late 80s, early 90s, started reemerging into the public sphere. And then at that point, some of those mysteries finally began to firm up to of the last little bit of her life. So only in 2017, so really recently, let that sink in, just in 2017, did a coalition of researchers finally pin down the date of her death. This is the official record of her death, but unfortunately, one of the reasons that it went missing or, or unnoticed for so long was that her age and her actual name were listed incorrectly. Her 
given name is Mary Edmonia, Edmonia Lewis, but we know that throughout her entire life, she went not by Mary Lewis. She went by Edmonia Lewis. Every once in a while, you'll see her written as M. Edmonia Lewis, but again, Edmonia was always the key word. So her death records were missed by scholars for a very long time. And the fact that she was listed as being 42 years old, when in fact she was actually 67 when she died. So a lot of the details got wrong here, were wrong here. And so for the longest time, it was assumed that this Mary Lewis was a different Mary Lewis. If you look very closely, it's hard to see because it is quite small, this image and very blurry. It says under occupation spinster, but then also sculptural artist. So there is exactly the background. We know this is the real Edmonia Lewis. She died on September 17th, 1907, was listed as a sculptor. She died of Bright disease, which apparently I had to look this up. I didn't know much about it. It is a, a terrible, painful kidney disease. And we do know that finally it says that she was buried in a place right off of the road Hammersmith. She was buried in the Roman Catholic Cemetery of St. Mary's in London. And when all of this finally came to light, art historians and other researchers in London, here's by the way, a, a newspaper announcement of her death where it does list her as Mary Edmonia Lewis, formerly of Rome. And that is the uh, address of her studio in Rome. Up until very recently, her grave site was discovered, and this is what it looked like. It was completely overgrown. Um, this is an image from, I believe, in 2017 that Marilyn Richardson took. So when it was finally confirmed and rediscovered, so we finally know where she ended up living, her final years of her life, where she died, some professional and amateur historians decided to band together, and they created a GoFundMe project to fund an actual gravestone, an actual marker which they did. So that wonderful. I read an article that came out in 2018 to talk about this, uh, this project, this GoFundMe project. And they talked about sort of joking that they meant because Edmonia Lewis herself identified herself as a spinster and sculptor, but that they joked that they thought it would probably be best if they just left off the spinster part. So it does just say Edmonia Lewis sculptor. So I think now more than ever, she's really starting to become rec recognized as a major creative force in the 19th century, especially in the US, and truly a success story that has far too long been forgotten. And I think over the past couple of years, not only the rediscovery of her gravesite and this wonderful new grave marker that they put on there, but there have been a couple other signs of her renaissance, so to speak. The first was that around the same time that her uh, the same year that her gravesite was discovered, there was the showcasing of her work, especially the death of Cleopatra and her sculpting it in the Google Doodle for the first time. So this was for February 1st, 2017. And we were talking about this right before we got live here on the Zoom, but just this year, very, very exciting. In January, she has her own USPS stamp. So you can also, I, I don't want to let this fact go go astray is that you have the chance to see another of one of her most iconic works in person right now at the Met because she is highlighted in this amazing show, which I would love to see, called Fictions of Emancipation, Carpo Recast. So it's like, oh, I'm trying to come up with excuses so I can come up to, uh, to New York to see this show. It's like, maybe I should start a GoFundMe page so I can make the trip. But in all seriousness, this show has been lauded, I think, as one of the must-see exhibitions of the year. And it's all about reconsidering this work by Carpeau, which is called Why Born Enslaved, with an exclamation point. That's from 1873. And it aims to examine the traditions of Western sculpture, in particular, through the lens of slavery and colonialism and vice versa. And so this show isn't just focused on this Carpeau sculpture, even though that's really the central image of it, but it also highlights 35 other works that relate to the subject. And right there in the middle is Edmonia Lewis's Forever Free. This is from 1867. And what I think is really cool, especially about this, is that Edmonia sculpted this work a year before Carpeau molded his sculpture. So he molded it first, and then it was carved in 1873. 
And also, unlike the Carpeau and a lot of the other works in this exhibition that depict, uh, excuse me, depict Black men in particular, we have an image of someone who is victorious. So he is not shackled. It's called Forever Free. And you can see that he is holding the broken shackles in his hands, holding it over his head. His eyes are glancing up to the heavens and his hand is then protectively leaning on the shoulder of his companion. So it's really a beautiful statement, a beautiful piece. And again, really unique within the realm of this single new exhibition at the Met because it's showcasing showcasing someone who, as the title says, is forever free. So please, if you are so inclined and you have the means, please go see the show, report back to me. I hope you love it. I want to let Edmonia Lewis have the last word because I think she is such an incredibly fascinating, very complicated person and artist, but someone who was also very proud of her background and also shied away from it, who exploited it and capitalized upon it and on her, you know, quote unquote, exoticism uh, and her unique place, but who then also despised that she was considered exotic too. So she's very contradictory in so many ways. And she understood that she got the attention that she sometimes had because of her background, but it also didn't want to keep, or it didn't keep her from wanting to be seen. So it really was number one that she wanted to be seen as a talented and hardworking artist first and foremost. And she wanted to be praised really for the quality of her work above anything else. And in 1864, she told a reporter, oh, sorry, here's the, um, close up at Forever Free to see her sculptor, her, her signature, where it says that it was made in Rome in 1867 and the title Forever Free that's emblazoned there. In 1864, Edmonia Lewis spoke to a reporter from Boston's newspaper, The Liberator, and she said, some praise me because I am a colored girl and I don't want that kind of praise. I would rather you point out my defects for that will teach me something. I love that statement because she again wants to be recognized for what she's doing, more importantly than her background or who she is as a person. It's her work that truly was what she felt most defined her and her life. So thank you all for joining me on this Monday night to talk about Edmonia Lewis. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to please, if you're interested, to subscribe and listen to my podcast, Art Curious, if you are, again, interested. Um, it's this kind of tale that I like to tell on the podcast. And again, as Marilyn mentioned at the very beginning, it explores the unexpected and slightly odd and strangely wonderful side of art history. So I like to showcase the different stories of art that are less about the terminology of art history and more about just the fun stories. So uh, I also mentioned the story of the death of Cleopatra very briefly, really, really just a paragraph in my book, Art Curious, which again, you can find anywhere you like to buy your favorite books. So please do so if you are inclined. And mostly, I just love the opportunity to geek out about art. So thank you so much for allowing me to do that with you tonight. So thank you all. And I would love to answer any questions if I can, if anyone has any. I'll stop sharing my screen too. Okay. Thank you, um, everyone. Oh, boy. Got Okay got some stuff coming in. Yeah, <laughs> a long one. Read. Oh boy, okay. So Jack says, Lowry Sims, associate credit, uh, cur excuse me, curator of 20th century art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art observed, art history was not a career that black middle-class children were taught to aspire to. Absolutely. For one, the Eurocentrism of art history often made it irrelevant to black college students who had never heard African-American culture discussed in art history classes. I also have to say, neither did I when I was coming up 20 years ago in art history. Museums, the major conduit for teaching young people about art were not always accessible to blacks. African-Americans were socialized into certain careers after reconstruction. Visual art was not one of them. The economic realities made a career in art even less desirable. You don't see many Black visual artists until the 1920s and 30s when the Black colleges started to establish art departments. Black art historians are an even rarer breed. 
I second all of that. And I cannot say it any better than Larry Sims. He is absolutely right on all the fronts. And as an art curator myself, I have to say, museums have done traditionally, in most cases, a bad job of showcasing diverse art to audiences. This is a problem. And luckily, thankfully, in the last five years, especially, this is something that's being treated much more seriously. Even at my own institution, the North Carolina Museum of Art, before I left this past fall to work on Art Curious full time, this was a hard conversation. And we've taken works off view that did not serve our population, did not do any good. And uh, it's definitely a problem because again, who had the ability to become artists? How, how about how about black art historians though? Are, That's are been also difficult, I think, because I think you're right, and I think also uh, I would have to not only not push back necessarily, but art history as a major, as a career, as a subject matter for study in universities, I think is still not often taken seriously. Um, it's seen as kind of like a, a soft major in a lot of ways. That was something that even myself I fought against, especially because I originally was a science major before I switched to art history. So, you know, there's a lot of conflict, I think, where people think that it's not something that's valid, but it absolutely is. Just like history in general is valid, art history is a branch of history and just a different way, a visual way to tell stories about the background of our world. Um, so I would say that, yes, there aren't a lot of Black art historians, but in general, there aren't a lot of art historians either. Unfortunately, that there aren't a lot of Black art historians, I think, again, is, I think, multiple issues at play here. One is that art history is always seen as an elitist tool or an elitist background, the kind of career for people who maybe were seen as having other career options or had family money or something to fall back on, not something to make a legitimate life out of, which I fight against even for young art historians coming up today. But then also I agree with this long, uh, I guess the hiding of some ways or the dismissal of art by any other diverse culture or background, religion, gender identity really has made it look like a career path for just a relative few. And that is so not the case. And I'm thankful it's changing. Um, I think also it's been really interesting to see that there are a lot more art historians who are black or coming from other diverse backgrounds who are not necessarily going straight into, for example, a lot of art historians who are black start out as African art historians. And now you don't see that quite as much, which is really interesting because now everybody feels like they can study whatever time period or background and medium that is most exci exciting and inspiring to them. So I feel like I rambled quite a bit on that one. My apologies. Um, <laughs> Close but to your it, heart. It's a topic close to your it's, heart. <laughs> it's, it's such a topic close to my heart. It's such a difficult topic. And it still is something that makes me so frustrated and so angry because there's still so much so much that can be done and needs to be done. Um, but my, I, I guess I, at least I, people are working on it now. That's my, my, I'm so thankful for that. And I'm looking forward to more. I think that museums, and I, I would like to give a plug to um, the Metropolitan. They're actually doing a terrific job um, in, in diversifying their collection and highlighting their collection. And they have a, um, in the last month I've seen, um, I went to a heritage um, tour, which was about in uh, Black History Month. I went to the, they have an Afrofuturism room, which is absolutely fascinating. And I've been to the Carpo exhibit, which is tremendous. Yeah. Um, they're really, really doing an extraordinary, I think, a renovation of their whole <laughs> Eurocentro collections. Yes. And I have to say, I, I want to give them, um, you know, praise for even doing the Carpo recast exhibition, because I think in lesser hands, other museums might say, ooh, our Carpo doesn't look so good now. We're just going to take it off view and we're not going to talk about it for a while. We're just going to keep quiet about it. The fact that they've made it a central 
exhibition, point to this exhibition, and that they're trying to look at it in a different way, especially in context with other ways that enslaved peoples were shown in art and include work by people like Edmonia Lewis to round out that narrative. That's very cool and it's very key. And it also reminds me of the fact that this is why we still have need for art historians and especially art historians of many different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think it's hard when you look at the out you know, from the outside, you look at somebody and you go, is there really much more that you can say about Leonardo da Vinci that hasn't already been said? Mm -hmm. But there is always something new because There's you always, always have somebody with a different perspective and mm -hmm. more research can be done. Yeah, Always more. We have a couple more questions in the chat from Mary. The, oh, works, yes. the works we saw tonight, including Death of Cleopatra, had very European features. Was this typical of Lewis's works? I believe so. That's a very good question. I don't have like a 100% sure answer, but I would say so because of her background, her training and the tradition in which she's working. Um, that was kind of the Eurocentric features, the Euro European tradition features. That was kind of just how you sculpted um, for better or for worse. So I would say that that was very typical. I haven't seen anything different in her works of art. And again, I mentioned a lot of, of them still are missing works that we know existed from records like the um, work of the bust of Ulysses S. Grant, for example. But most everything that I've seen of her work, I would say they all fall into that same look and that same tradition. Also, how many people would work on a large piece? Are there similar models of other lost works? Not that I have found in the research. Again, I'm, I'm not an Edmonia Lewis scholar specifically, so I'm not as deeply embedded in, in her background as I think other art historians are who really focus so truly on her work. But I did find there were some really interesting sites that I found online where there are some very rare drawings that she did from her time in Rome. So that's really cool because you don't see a lot of her preparatory work. You don't see cast models for the most part. Um, no, it's really interesting. And a lot of that could be perhaps it didn't get archived or saved the way that maybe other artists would have done. Perhaps it was that she had to sell them off and people didn't know that they were buying a work of importance or that it got pawned. I think the fact that she moved quite a bit, she made several large relocations, but I'm especially thinking about that relocation from Rome to London for that last part of her life where she really fell into obscurity. I think a lot of works really were lost at that point, and that could include preparatory and smaller pieces. Okay, sense. let's see. Yeah. Lois says the March 2022 issue of Smithsonian Magazine has an article on Imbonia Lewis entitled When Cleopatra Died Again. Ooh! Oh, I have to look that up. I haven't seen that. Oh, there you go. That's perfect timing. Absolutely. Oh, thank you for the link. Yay. Perfect yes. timing. <laughs> oh my gosh. That is the best possible timing. I love it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read it after. Okay. Are, th are there any other questions I can answer for you tonight? Um, I'll just the... say that. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I just had one specific question about um, you showed a um, a newspaper article with um, the prices of, of what you know she she received for a certain sculpture on the bottom it yeah. said and also announced her engagement yes I I didn't bring that up but I was wondering if there would be any eagle-eyed <laughs> readers in there no I have not found anything it did say that she announced her engagement I have not found anything anywhere about that engagement or that relationship. Again, I, I, I could probably dig into biographies a lot deeper, but she was never mentioned outside of that as being in a relationship. She obviously did not marry um, and she called herself again a spinster. That was her choice of wording. So I think that's really interesting, but yeah, mm -hmm. it obviously did not pan out. Hmm. And in some ways I think she was better for it for at least her career. Um, Cause I'm not sure about how, how how much success she would have gotten if she did end up marrying, if there would have been any detriment. You know, we hope not, but again, this was the late 19th century. There wasn't that much career support for women the same way that there would be now, or even just a couple decades later. 
Debbie says, I wonder if the modesty of the times affected the lack of interest in purchasing the death of Cleopatra. I completely think so. I agree because we do have that bared breast. That's part of that. Um, you know, I think a lot of Cleopatra has for a very long time. And I mean, even think about Elizabeth Taylor. She's been a figure that from almost the very beginning was really lauded as being so sensual. So I think that's always been an element that's been of interest in depicting Cleopatra as kind of the sexy side. But I agree with you. Um, it's one thing if you're a painter in France or Rome, perhaps, but in the US, you know, we, we have that Puritan tradition. And so I agree with you. It may be entirely possible. That that's one of the main reasons besides its size and probably the price that would go along with a work of that size that it didn't find a buyer. That's a great observation. Amazing that it was rescued after so many Can you years. believe it? I mean, really, uh, that's why I'm hopeful that other works, I'm, you know, I'm all, I'm never the person that says, I don't think it'll never show up. I'm always hopeful. It's the same thing with the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum of Theft. It's like, I am always hopeful that those works will show up. But I have to think that because that is such a huge piece that was, much easier to reclaim, you know, that that small hand that she first sold, that seems like it was a fairly modest work. So that seems like the chances of that being located again and firmly identified as an Ammonia Lewis work, chances are probably a little slimmer there. But for the fact that that was gone and in storage for so long, I mean, really a long time, over a century, it took that long for historians to fully track it down and to identify it is a crazy story. And I really love it because I think it just gives you hope. There are so many masterpieces out there. There's so many wonderful works of art that we hopefully will have more of a chance to discover. There's still so much. It's really exciting. It is. I think that was it on the questions. Okay. Um, so, I wanna thank you so much, Jennifer, for being with us tonight. It was, it was great and so interesting. Um, and you were a great guide, so we appreciate it. It's been my pleasure, I mean, my goodness. <laughs> thank you, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank Again, you. I, I love nothing more than to talk about art. Art and travel are my two favorite things. So okay. <laughs> honoring me by giving me the chance to talk about it, thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Okay, oh, I think we're ready to say good night to everyone. It's getting late. Okay, thank you. Thank you, okay. everyone. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.